Coming up, we talk Formula One and another controversial sprint weekend. Juan Pablo Montoya gives us his opinion on that move. Alfa Romeo have confirmed their driver lineup for 2022. Team principal Fred Vasseur dropped by to say hello. We'll talk supercars and DTM, IMSA and the WRC. Nikki Shields talks Formula E. We'll talk MotoGP. And World Endurance champion Jose Maria Lopez says hello. All that and more coming your way this week on this week's episode of This Week. Quite a lot to get through this week, haven't we? Uh, welcome, folks, to This Week with Will Buxton. This is This Week. I am Will Buxton. Uh, let's go over the week's news in motor racing, shall we? And we'll start, as we always do, with Formula One, the third of three sprint events of the 2021 season. And once again, a little bit of controversy. It started early. Lewis Hamilton rumoured for so long to need a new power unit or new engine components, at least to see it through to the end of the season. Took a new engine at the start of the weekend, giving him a five place grid penalty for the race on Sunday. He promptly qualified his car fastest, but the car was then disqualified for a slight technical irregularity with the rear wing. He fought back from 20th to 5th, took the five-place grid penalty, started the race 10th, won. It was an astonishing drive from Lewis Hamilton. Yes, he had a fresh engine in the back of his car, but take nothing away from Hamilton on what was inarguably one of his best weekends in the sport and has had drivers, luminaries, world champions, saying quite possibly one of the finest drives in the history of Formula One. However, he didn't have it all easy. Lap 48, the moment with Max Verstappen, where Verstappen defended perhaps a little bit over the limit down at turn four. Uh, ultimately, no investigation deemed necessary by race control, but that was because race control did not have access to the front facing camera on Max Verstappen's car. When that footage was released earlier this week, Mercedes have appealed the decision not to uh, penalise Max Verstappen. We now wait to find out whether the stewards will allow the appeal, whether it will be heard, whether any penalty will be given to Max Verstappen. I thought it was worth, though. Great way, great weekend, uh, and I was really happy that we got to see the move done on track. Uh, another twist in the McLaren versus Ferrari fight for P3 in the Constructors' Championship. McLaren having another horrible weekend. Ferrari scoring with both cars uh, and things really turning to Ferrari's favour. Uh, also an intriguing weekend between Alpha Tauri and Alpine as both Alpine scored points, but with Pierre Gasly having another stellar weekend for Alpha Tauri, they're still level on points with three races left to go. Now, news breaking this week is that Antonio Venazzi will no longer be a Formula One driver in 2022. His place will be taken by Guan Yu Zhou, thus becoming the first Chinese driver to get a full time seat in Formula One. Of course, a standout in Formula Two will be fascinating to see how he gets on. Uh, it does, of course, mean that Antonio Giovinazzi will have to uh, find a race seat elsewhere. More on that later but for now i'm delighted to say that on the line we have guan yu joe's new boss team principal at alfa romeo racing fred vasseur who joins us now fred thanks so much for joining us uh your lineup for 2022 is now complete uh guan yu joe had been rumored for some time but now it's all confirmed how happy are you to uh, to finally have your driver for next year yeah, it's a good feeling because now we will be fully focused on 2022. And at least I won't have your question anymore on Thursday. But this is a good <laughs> point. <laughs> but, um, no, no, seriously, it's an important uh, uh, page to, to, to fulfill that, uh, you know, that uh, we are focused on 2022 for a long time now. And to, to fix the lineup was an important uh, step into the process. But um, no, I'm happy with the lineup. I'm happy with the combination. And uh, I can't wait to be in uh, 2022 now. I know you, you always have a keen eye on the guys coming through the, the junior categories. How much has Joe impressed you? What have you seen from him that's really stood out, particularly over his time in Formula 2? 
Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be always a bit focused on F2 that uh, I think this season you have a strong lineup, that you have good drivers uh, with more or less experience you know, on, the, on the field. But uh, Joe did very well that he won in, uh, in Silverstone. It's probably one of the, the most relevant track of the season with Bahrain. He won also in Bahrain that uh, it's very demanding for the tire management and so that he did a very good job with pole positions. He's still a contender for the championship and that uh, for sure it's a, a bit strange to take a decision with two, two events to, to go. But in the other end, we can't wait the end of uh, Abu Dhabi to take a decision. Uh, and on the top of this, that Joe did, um, I met him a couple of times, that he is impressive in terms of maturity. And, uh, and for us, it's also quite important because the, F2, the F1 will be a an important step compared with the F2 and uh, we have to keep in mind that we won't have so many test days. It means that we'll have to be ready after uh, six test day this winter with the new regulation, a completely new package from the engine to the tires to the chassis that it's a, a, a new game in front of us. But uh, I'm optimistic that he impressed me when we met and the speech is very clear, very mature and uh, he's doing well in F2. Does the fact that it's a completely new car for everyone in Formula One next year actually make this a really good time to bring a rookie in because everyone essentially is going to be starting from, from fresh? Yeah, I think that you, you can have the two approach and to say that it's the, the good timing to have a guy with experience or at least with the experience of the team for the continuity and uh, you will have some other uh, team principal perhaps uh, taking another approach. I think that it was very important to have at least someone with a huge experience of the F1, as Val Valtteri will do the job, that uh, he's, he's now in F1 for almost 10 years. I think that uh, he has a huge experience from Mercedes, and he will bring this experience to the team, and this is important. But I think also that the continuity with the previous car, as the previous car is completely different, I'm not sure that's a big advantage, and uh, we'll line up. Uh, for the preparation is the, uh, I think it's a good combination. Uh, you've spoken about Valtteri. It seems that ever since he signed to race for you guys next year, he's come alive. You know, it's, it's like the Valtteri we remember from, from years ago. Uh, what does that tell you? What does that show you about, you know, the driver that you've signed in Valtteri, the confidence that he's got from a multi-year deal with you guys? Yeah, I think it's important that for sure that he, he knew when he signed with us that it, it will be difficult for him to get the same results as Mercedes. But in the other end, that uh, we offered something a bit different. That he will be uh, central into, into your project. He will be the, the key driver, that it's not uh, pessimistic or pejorative with, uh, with Zoo. But he will bring the experience. He will be key for the development of the car. He will be key on the, the first races. And I think for Valtteri, it was important to, to have this position into a team. When you are the teammate of Lewis, you know perfectly that it won't be a, an easy place, that you, you will be a little bit in the shadow of your, your teammate. And I think it's an important step into the career of Valtteri, even if we don't imagine to, to fight with Mercedes next year. But the position into the team will be completely different. And I think for him and for his own perspective, it, this was an important step. And Valtteri is a driver you know well. You ran him at ART in Formula 3. You won the championship with him in GP3. How much are you looking forward to, to working with him again? Yeah, it's important to have this kind of relationship. And uh, we had the same with, uh, with Charles a couple of years ago. When you know the drivers from the junior series, the relationship is a bit different. Uh, and this... We have a huge mutual trust and that this is an important part of the collaboration that uh, I know perfectly the, the Valtteri and the, the way how he's, re he's, re he's able to react. And, uh, and uh, I think it's true in the, on both sides. And this is for sure will help us on the, on the collaboration. Uh, looking towards next year, very, very quickly, in terms of the car, we've seen uh, the version that F1's put out. I'm not expecting you to give us all of your trade secrets, but how's the car? Good move. Uh, Good move. Yeah, I mean, you can give us all the secrets <laughs> if you want, um, but how's, how's the car looking? Are you happy with, with uh, everything as, as it's going? Will it look substantially the same from what we've seen from F1 or? 
so far so good. I think that so far everybody is world champion first. That, uh, <laughs> uh, but so, <laughs> but so far, no, honestly, that we we tick all all the box. That uh, and so far everything is going very well. You know, on the project, I don't want to give you any details for this for sure. That uh, and, and you knew perfectly when we asked that question. But <laughs> <laughs> but so, so far everything is going in the right direction. We are quite optimistic and. Uh, as we stop the current project at the end of 19, I think we are quite advanced, perhaps also compared to competitors. And uh, uh, and with the new regulation, we had more slots than some other team on the on the wind tunnel. And uh, mm. I think we have uh, we have some good aspect on the project that we are not late, and this is important in terms of homologation, design, process, release of the drawings. Everything is sticking to the plan and uh, we can be optimistic. Uh, it's been a really difficult couple of years for, for everybody in, in the sport with, with COVID and an awful lot of travel. The, the team, I know the boys and girls at the, at the moment in the middle of a, a triple header, three races in three weeks on three continents. How is everybody doing at the team? How are you guys set for the, for the final three races? For sure, it's, uh, it's it's difficult, and that uh, it's much more difficult for the team members than for me because at first we are not uh, traveling and so in the same conditions. But uh, I think more about us than about me. Uh, but in the other end, that uh, we know that we have still three races to go, and uh, we are now touching the we are not far away of Abu Dhabi, <laughs> and it was a long season also for us because that we decided, as I said before to stop the development uh, 12 months ago. And we knew perfectly at this stage that the season will be long. That uh, when you know that you won't bring any update during the season, then you have 23 races to go, that it's a, it's a challenge in terms of motivation. But we are focused on some other points. I think we made good progress, mainly in, in terms of uh, exploitation on track. And this will pay off also next year that uh, on, the, on the second part of the season, we were uh, always in Q2 sometimes in Q3 with uh, with Antonio that uh, and we are I think going in the right direction perhaps it's not enough uh, okay but uh, in terms of pure performance we did quite well on the on this season you mentioned Antonio he's clearly upset that that he won't be continuing in formula 1 if i may say I've, he's driven really well these last couple of weekends but his messages and what he's kind of saying outwardly has been should we say a little bit negative maybe more than a little bit negative how do you put a stop to that how do you make sure that he performs at his optimum for these for these final 3 and and it, and it doesn't get messy well, honestly, I think it's important for, for him to close the chapter, at least on this season, doing well on track. I saw the comments. Honestly, I'm not a big fan of this kind of uh, attitude. Uh, also because the team gave him the chance to do three seasons in F1. Alfa Romeo gave him the chance to do three seasons in F1. And um, tons of drivers would have dreamed to do it. Uh, now he will have other challenge. He will have to do well in other challenge. Perhaps that he will come back in a, in F1 in the future. But it's a small world, and uh, we have to stay professional. Thanks for that, Fred. Very finally, then uh, I know that Theo Pocher remains part of the family. You 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 believe he has a big future. We believe he's got a big future. Great driver. Um, how does his future look? From uh, we'd imagine going back to Formula Two next year, but beyond that, will there be space for him at Alfa Romeo in the future? Uh, we will have always space for a driver, for a driver if he's. Uh, winning first and uh, no I think they are um, speaking about Theo that uh, as you said that uh, we have to keep in mind that 18 months ago he was in F4 um, he, he did two important steps moving from F4 to F3 he did very well in F3 last year uh, 21 again it was a huge step with the F2 that he did again very well in F2 this season uh, winning in Monaco that doing good races good quality uh, but I think also it's the, the step is to, uh, probably a bit too early with the F1. Uh, he has to get experience. I know perfectly that F1 is a tough world and it's a, a gun with one bullet, you know, that if you do the mistake that you will have tons of journalists killing you. 
that uh, <laughs> it means that uh, um, you have to be very ready and i i had long discussion with theo and i think it's much better for him to to be focused on f2 again to win the championship and then we'll uh, we'll see what we can do I like that. I like that. Fred, thank you so much for your time. Best of luck in Qatar this weekend and for the final three races of the F1 season, my friend. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. See you soon. Ciao, ciao. Time now for Formula E news. And Antonio Giovinazzi's departure from Formula One came on the same day that he announced he would be joining Formula E for Dragon Penske. It's going to be fascinating to see how he gets on. Also in Formula E news this week, uh, Sergio Sete Camera has been reconfirmed at Dragon Penske uh, for season eight in 2022. Neo have unveiled their new car livery for the new season, but are yet to announce a teammate for Oliver Turvey uh, to discuss Formula E and all things season eight and Gen 3 and moving to the future and a whole lot else uh, <laughs> besides is the voice of Formula E. Uh, you'll recognise her from the pit lanes from around the world, Nikki Shields. Hello. Hello. Good Gr morning. Great to see you. I'm great. I'm really, really good. Um, Formula E, a lot is going on, obviously. Uh, we saw each other last at the Jaguar launch, yes, we which did was indeed. fantastic. Um, but testing is just around the corner for season eight. Eight. What kind of a season do we think we've got in store? Ooh, uh, well, it's always got to be bigger and better, hasn't it? <laughs> the car's going to be faster, which is always a positive. Um, and we're just excited, I think, to go testing again. I mean, there's, there's a couple of drivers still to be announced. But other than that, we've got a pretty solid grid. 11 teams, 22 drivers. Um, lots of old favourites are going to be back in the paddock. Um, so we've also got an extended race calendar now. 16 races, three new tracks, Jakarta, Seoul and Vancouver, which will be absolutely spectacular. Um, and I think we're just all looking forward to going into a full season because yeah. obviously, you know, with the season that we've just had um, and obviously all the um, impact of COVID, it wasn't wasn't quite the one that we had planned. So we're just really excited to go racing again. And yeah, testing in Valencia um, happening in just under two weeks time. Uh, uh, there have been some changes obviously to the cars. There's some homologation between last year and this, a lot of software tweaks that people are talking about going into next year. Interestingly, when we talked to Nick DeVries last week, he said Mercedes yeah. haven't changed very much, if anything at all, on their car. How do you see the competitive landscape shifting from what you know of, of how teams have been working? Uh, we, I feel like we do say this every season, but I do feel like this season is going to be even more competitive because there is only so much, as you say, there really isn't that much you can do to the Gen 2 car now. This will be its last yeah. year. Um, and so I think we've got to that point now, you know, when the Gen 2 car first came on the scene, we maybe saw some teams with 90, 92, 93% efficiency. So there was still quite a lot to gain. A lot of the cars are now running at kind of 97-98% efficiency, which is phenomenal, but yeah. it just means there's so little margin between it. Obviously, the big changes is going to be that season 9 when the Gen 3 car arrives and none of us have seen it yet. I don't um, believe that. Come on, even <laughs> even you genuinely. So I was with Jamie Regal last week at COP26 and he had photos of the car on his phone and he refused to show us all. <laughs> But it has apparently just sort been of running wafted it. in Valencia, apparently, this week. Do you think you might get a there, sneaky there, peek? There, is, there are potential possible rumours that we may. A very, very small select nice. group. <laughs> nice. But I couldn't possibly say. Um, there are big changes, though, coming for Season 8. Notably, uh, you're reverting back to the old tyre allocations. Yep. Practice time is being reduced but I think the big one and the one that's got everybody talking is the qualifying change. Yeah this is really really exciting because there's been a big question mark over qualifying for quite a few years now. How do we tackle qualifying in yeah. Formula E because we have previously we've had this sort of this group set up and the drivers in the early days it used to be a group lottery so you'd go into group one and it was a lottery on which group you might be in um, a lot of the drivers found that unfair because they said I get group one more often than I get group four and um, there is um, an advantage of being in the latter groups of course group three seems to be the optimum one um, just due to mainly just the track evolution when you go out particularly on a street circuit it's very dusty in the early days in group one so group one tends to be the slowest 
have the biggest disadvantage. Uh, the last couple of seasons, we've done it based on championship order. So the most successful drivers, the quickest drivers. A disadvantage. A disadvantage yeah. going into qualifying so not in group one. Happy. So they're not happy, although they're all in disadvantage equally, I suppose you could say. Um, it's always kind of there's this sweet spot of being about seventh in the championship because then you get to go into group two. <laughs> um, but you only want to sit there for so long in the season. Um, but this year, it is, it's kind of, um, it's reformatted. It's more like these qualifying jewels. Mm. And so what we're going to have, um, 22 drivers, first of all, they're split the first round round of qualifying split into two 11 drivers in each the odds and the evens so if you're championship order first third fifth and so on you, you go out first um in the a group then you're second fourth sixth and so on you go out in the b group um and then it's the quick you get a couple of opportunities to set the fastest lap the quickest four from each of those groups then go into the duels. Then it's the quarterfinals, the semifinals and the finals. Love it. And each of those are two drivers each. Um, and again, of course, it's the quickest driver from each of those duels that goes on into the next stage. I love that. So it's going to be quite exciting. Yeah. We're actually going to be testing it, um, yeah, testing, uh, when we're in Valencia just to see how it flows, how it runs, how long it takes. Um, and I think we're all really, really excited. It's always nice to shake a competition up a bit, something to look forward to and I think just seeing sort of you know in those the final three rounds the the quarterfinals the semis and the finals seeing the jewels on those city street circuits is going to be quite exciting. Trialing a format change I did during yes. testing it'll <laughs> never catch on. Um, <laughs> you mentioned you were at COP26. Yes. Hugely so. important couple of weeks uh, mm. in Glasgow <clears> obviously <throat> very recently. Motorsport yeah. had a big attendance as well. Did. What did you learn from those couple of weeks up in Scotland. In, I mean, in particular, I'm looking from it from a motorsport perspective in terms of future relevance and, I guess, sustainability and how we move this sport into the future. Absolutely, I think it was a, a brilliant demonstration. How actually, quite a lot of other industries were looking to motorsports, um, because obviously we have gone through such a huge change, particularly of course with Formula E, yeah. um, and what they're doing in the wider world when it comes to electrification of our road cars. And I think what we've seen is just this massive, I mean, we're, we're talking about one of the biggest industries in the world, the automotive industry, has gone through this absolutely huge revolution, the biggest revolution since it kind of, since it started yeah. really, since yeah. inception. Um, you know, there are more, I think Tesla was the, the biggest, most popular selling car on our roads this year, not out of electric cars, just out of Full all stop. cars, yeah. um, which I think just shows how things are changing. And the fact that motorsport is obviously sort of really paved the way in being able to give these car manufacturers the platform to test all the infrastructure, um, and not so much the infrastructure, I suppose, but test the technology that we're seeing and you know developing from the racetrack into our road cars um, was kind of an example for other industries. It's like, well, hang on a minute, okay, if if motorsport, if the automotive world can do you know a 180 in such a short amount of time, uh, then surely the rest of us can follow. Um, and it was just a really nice kind of celebration of what's been achieved so far, and also a reminder of how far we've come. You know. Electric cars, they didn't really exist on our roads back in, you know, Formula E started in 2014. Yeah. Um, and they weren't, they were, they were kind of few and far between. And to be honest, they were a bit slow, didn't go very far, and they weren't that cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so hopefully Formula E has kind of demonstrated that actually um, they can be quite quick. We can go not to 16 under three seconds. <laughs> so is it you know, very much motorsport and the motoring industry being that, that driver for change to say, look, you know, for 100 years we did things a certain way and in yeah. less than a decade we've almost entirely revolutionized the way that we think about how we go about our business you can do it too yeah exactly um, and I think it is as you say it's this example of actually um, if you get the a I guess it comes down to sort of the policy changes the policy makers um, but also if you do go to the big guys at the top the corporates if you get their buy-in um, and they believe in this change, then things can happen really, really fast. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Nikki, lovely to have you in the studio today. Thanks, Thanks so <laughs> much. Uh, really looking forward to Formula E season eight. When's testing happening? Uh, the date, I think it's the 29th. Oh, that's probably wrong, isn't it? Maybe that's the day I'm flying. <laughs> it's a Monday and a end, Tuesday of that week. <laughs> end of November, start of December, sometime around there. A much better answer. You're a professional before, at this. Before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Can't wait. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me well. <laughs>
Great to have Nikki Shields on the show. Right, let's move through some more news and we start down under with supercars, which once again was in Sydney. And once again, saw Anton De Pasquale absolutely ripping up the track. Race one, victory. Race two, victory. Race three, not his victory. Um, Brown won uh, the third race uh, at Sydney, this version of Sydney. But the big talking point coming out of the weekend was a team orders Ferrari between teammates Jamie Winkup and Shane Van Gisbergen because you had Winkup P2, SVG P3 behind Brown. Winkup told, let Shane through. He didn't do it. He said, look, it's my last year in the sport. I want to try and do everything I can. I want to try and win the races. Fair enough, you think. Shane Van Gisbergen's got like ridiculous lead in the championship anyway. But here's the thing. Jamie Winkup's going to be Shane Van Gisbergen's team boss next year. So that's quite fun. Uh, right, moving on to DTM. And uh, renowned Lamborghini squad Grassa Racing have confirmed that they will join the DTM in 2022 fielding for Huracan GT3 Evos. Um, so that's going to be great. They've got factory support on that. So uh, that could be quite a serious new entry for the DTM. Meanwhile, with BMW... Uh, leaving IMSA, their 2012 DTM champ Bruno Spengler has said that he would quite fancy a return to the DTM. Might we see him back? That would be uh, that would really be something. Uh, while we're talking IMSA, we have of course to look to Petit Le Mans, which took place last week with Mazda signing off their participation in IMSA with a win. Um, Ticknell. Jarvis and Bon Marito uh, drove their, their Mazda uh, all the way to the top step of the podium. Beautiful way to sign off uh, for them. But the battle for second behind was ultimately the battle for the championship. Uh, Taylor sending it up the inside in the dying laps of the race, going a bit too deep, giving the position back ultimately to Pippo Durrani and Felipe Nazza, who, with a little bit of help from Mike Conway, managed to secure the championship. Thoroughly deserved uh, for the AXR Cadillac guys. Um, a brilliant season. I've loved watching IMSA this year. Just a, it's been such a, such a great championship season and such a wonderful fight all the way down to the final laps uh, at Petit Le Mans. Just wonderful. Uh, news over the last couple of days and in fact news breaking this afternoon for the lineup at Mayor Shank in IMSA next season. Oli Jarvis uh, was confirmed today. Tom Blomquist confirmed as well. Uh, we were saying earlier of course that that sister seat at Neo alongside Oliver Turvey yet to be filled. That was Tom Blomquist's seat but now confirmed that he will of course be with Mayor Shank racing. Uh, let's stick with endurance and move over to the World Endurance Championship now because last week we were talking about Glickenhaus and how they were very unhappy with the BOP regulations and would they return to work or wouldn't they return to work and then WEC saying well if you don't do all the races next year then we don't want you back at all. Glickenhaus have now confirmed they will enter all World Endurance Championship races in 2022 therefore securing their place well bit sideways, um, they're securing their place uh, in the World Endurance Championship next year. The privateer squad, who of course impressed everybody uh, in WEC and at Le Mans, of course, this year. Um, so yeah, great to see them back in 2022. Um, now it's a very short period of time since we had the World Endurance Championship uh, resolved and the championships won. Toyota, of course, in this first year of the hypercar regulations, looking uh, so fantastic. And I am uh, absolutely thrilled to say that one of their champions uh, joins me uh, now as I have Jose Maria Lopez on the line. Mr. Lopez, uh, world endurance champion, uh, a podium at every single race this year, a Le Mans winner. Could it have gone any better? <laughs> well, I, I guess, I guess, I, I guess it's hard to 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 believe a better year. But um, yeah, it was pretty smooth. I mean, actually, you know, with this new change of regulations and the hypercar uh, regulations were was a was a big change so we, we we didn't know what to expect but uh yeah the team managed to win all the races we we were on the podium each of them um but yeah we were on the on the top of the podium 
uh, in the most important one as well, which was the one we were missing the, the previous years. Um, tell me about that change in regulation uh, to the hypercar regulations for this year. Obviously, a, a massive task for everybody at Toyota to, to, to come up to those new regulations. We know that Toyota is the class of the field, has been for so long. But can you give us a little insight into what it was like behind the scenes for, for Toyota, for everybody at that team to, you know, to embrace these new regulations and do the incredible job that Toyota did? Well, it's it's always very hard to approach a new a new regulation change, and especially a big one like this year. We 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 passed from a, from an LMP1, which is a car with um, more power, more downforce, to a, a different car. Um, but I would say, still with the spirit of endurance, I think it's uh, it's a car where you know. Um, I kind of like it a little bit more because you need to drive it more. I think that the driver has to put a little bit more because you don't have as much technology as we had before. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a heavier car, less downforce, um, less power, um, a regulation that is, it's been, I, I believe made for, for, for manufacturers you know, to attract manufacturers basically. And I think it, it, it did pay off because um, by the end of the next year, we're going to have plenty of them and the category is going to be um, really nice. So, but yeah, yeah, as, as we started testing, you know, of course we had up and downs. We we, we had to deal with, with, with things that we were not used to with, with other cars. So um, it, it was a long, long way. So when we basically arrived to to spa, we didn't know what to expect, you know. But but yeah, it went well. It went well, and and the car performed, and and it was incredible every race. So you know that's uh, mainly because of the team that made a, a great job, and all the people back in Germany and Japan that they've been working um, really hard on 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 this on this car. You, you mentioned a little bit there about um, the differences in the car and, and how it is to drive. Did you have to change anything particular in your driving style uh, for the year to get on top of this of this new car? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we had to adapt a lot, you know, because um, as I say, you know, the, the 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 weight of the car it was quite. There was a big difference in weight. Uh, um, we also, you know, before we used to have a lot of fuel cuts, we we had to do a lot of uh, fuel management with the LMP1. We were limited on, on the amount of fuel we, we we had per lap. So, and with this car was was over, so we, we pretty much started to to ride more like a normal car, you know, or getting there on the break in um, with full power and brake at the last minute. Um, and with all this weight and mass that, that we had, have now it was really difficult I, I i can say i could say that he adapted more on my driving style because you know all the years in touring cars probably and everything so i felt quite comfortable since the be since the beginning of the car um which was good and um i think that kind of reflected uh, um it reflect during the season you know i think I, it was my strongest season so far in 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 in, in WEC and you know um, it, it was nice to have this feeling of uh, back a little bit of what I was, I was used to. Yeah, it was a, an amazing year. And of course, capped off with the win at Le Mans. It's the big one. It's the one everybody wants to win, to, to, to finally stand on that top step, to soak that all in at that place with the fans back in the grandstands as well. I know not the full capacity, but still to have some you know, fans there to be on that top step. What does that mean? to you to, to to be up there and to see you know everyone beneath you well for me uh it meant uh, from my teammates Kamu and mike uh, it meant it meant a lot honestly um we we missed the man for um for for you know two, two years in a row basically we were pretty much winning the race and yeah um, and we had problems and we we had things and it seems that at one point we started thinking that, you know, we, Le Mans didn't want that, uh, you know, they say that Le Mans has to choose you to win. Yeah, so exactly, exactly. That, you know, it was, 
it, it was uh, it was hard. It was hard because we, you know, we, we pretty much work all the year. I mean, uh, for Le Mans. I mean, it's a, it's a whole championship, for, of course. But as you say, every everyone was with Le Mans. I mean, you hear drivers from Formula One. You ask them, and they would like to be in Le Mans when one day. Um, everybody wants to do the race, and 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 to get there when you when you start to know a little bit this race, uh, it, it is is it is very special um, for many things, and uh, and it's, it can be very cruel as well. Um, we experienced as as a team yeah. uh, many of them, and uh, yeah, but it, it, you know this year was just, you know we we knew we we you know it was a, it was an opportunity of course, but. As the car changed so much, we, we didn't know how how it was going to be. You know, we knew with the LMP1 that we were very competitive. Like the last few years, we knew kind of like a little bit the tricks and everything to, to get there and perform. But with this new car, we we didn't know what to expect. Um, but it went very smooth actually from from day one. We we felt comfortable and and the race we we, we had a, a great um, a great pace. And in my in my side, I had to. To take one of the of the tough, toughest stints in the, in the in the night, where I, I I took the lead and 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 it was quite nice actually. It was a a, a nice opportunity for me and 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 yeah, to win the money was it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, um, I could say my best moment in my career so far. Yeah, yeah, amazing job. And that night stint was was absolutely insane. It was such a great drive. Um, as you said, the, the, the hypercar regulations are, are bringing in so many new constructors, so many brands and marks to hypercar, back to Le Mans, back to the World Endurance Championship in 2022 and in 2023. Toyota has been the class of the field for so long, but how much are you actually relishing this challenge of everybody else that you're going to have to fight against in the top tier of endurance racing? I mean, well, we, we really, uh, we, we can't wait to, to have more people coming on the, on the category. As you said, there is, uh, I think there is around a manufacturers by the end of 2023. Mm. So yeah, it's a big step for the category. I think it's, it's going to be fantastic years and, and golden years for, for endurance championships. And uh, yeah, in our side, you know, we, we, we've been pushing ourselves, but you know, of course, uh, we want competition. We want, you know, uh, it will push us more, and and, and definitely it's 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 gonna get it's gonna be a game changing, a, a game changer. So um, yeah, well, I can't wait. I can't wait. I mean, I, you know, I remember the days back, uh, you know, 2017 when Porsche was there, um, Audi was there uh, in 16, um, and it was fantastic. But now, you know, we are talking about, as I said before, m many more manufacturers. Interested, you know, Ferrari is going to be back. Um, um, you know, BMW is going to be uh, there. Audi, Porsche, um, Glicke House, um, Alpine, uh, Cadillac. So yeah, I mean, it's going to be amazing. Honestly, it's going to be, <laughs> uh, and it's going to push us for better, of course. You know. Um, now tell us, what does a world endurance champion do once he's won the championship? What What's your itinerary look like for November and December? Are you having to test? Are you can you take it pretty easy, relax, see family? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, now uh, in a few weeks I, I'll, I'll probably be back uh, to Argentina a couple of weeks um, to to see my family um, because of this situation of COVID and everything. It's been some tough years and been far away from home. Uh, so yeah, I would take the opportunity, but yeah, uh, testing is, uh, starting very soon as well. You know, we, we, we need to start preparing for, for, for the first race of the season, which is going to be Sebring. And yeah, I mean, endurance is, is tough. There is a lot of testing. Uh, most of them, we, we call them endurance testing, which we run the car for 36 hours. Um, yeah, nights, day, you know, um, but, but, but yeah, well, I mean, now, I mean, who, who knows endurance is, 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 is quite special, you know, to, um, and quite tough at the same time, but, uh, I, I really enjoy it. Uh, just one final one then. Uh, at this weekend, Formula One is going to Qatar for the first time. It's a track that you know well. It's a track that you raced before. Uh, what can Formula One expect from, from this circuit uh, in Qatar? 
Uh, yeah, you're right. I raced uh, um, BWTC twice, and and yeah, it, it's very nice. I I remember back back in the days, it was uh, quite low grip to start with, and and it's quite slippery. But you have this combination of right corners, uh, which is similar, I would say, to to Turkey, um, but it's on the on the right side, uh, and and there is no banking, so. It's quite nice. I think it's it's very technical circuit, and I think Formula One is, yeah, it's going to be impressive to see these cars there. Honestly, yeah, fantastic stuff, man. Um, congratulations again on everything that, that you've achieved this year. The the championship, the Le Mans win. Uh, it's been really great yeah. watching you, watching you, and and you know all the boys at the team take that championship. And uh, look, enjoy the time off, enjoy the break. I hope you get to see the family. And uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, you're welcome. It was great to see you after so many years. Uh, yeah. We still we still here, so um, happy to to see you there, and yeah, happy from my side to still be enjoying and racing, of course. Awesome stuff, man. Take care. Take care. Bye. Can't wait to see how 2022 WEC looks and indeed into the future. I think the, uh, the World Endurance Championship shaping up for a really rich, vibrant few years. Right, let's finish off the news and we'll start with the World Rally Championship. The what now? The World Rally Championship, uh, which rolls into its final round this weekend with Rally Monza. And Sebastian Ogier is hoping to sign off his full-time WRC career with another championship. This will be his final full-time race in the WRC. He currently leads the championship standings by 17 points from Elfin Evans, who himself is vying to become the first British WRC champion since Richard Burns, believe it or not, 20 years ago. And we'll finish off the news section now talking uh, two-wheeled action uh, in MotoGP. The final round of the season and the final race won by Pekka Bagnaia. Um, but the big story, of course, uh, Valentino Rossi's retirement. Uh, it's a, a big, huge story, not just in, in bikes, but in the world of motor racing. He finished with a P10 uh, and what a career, what a legend. You know, they, they just aren't enough words uh, to describe who Valentino Rossi is, what he has brought to the world of MotoGP or indeed to the world of motor racing and something tells me he's not quite finished yet. Uh, Moto2 had its final race and it was an important one because it was the fight for the championship and despite Raul Fernandez winning, a P10 finish meant that Remy Gardner is your 2021 Moto2 champion a great season from him finally then moto three championship decided uh and uh, artiguez won the final round of the season but new champ pedro acosta was taken out on the final lap by his title rival dennis foggia a slightly messy ending to what's been a pretty exciting season in moto three And joining me now to look back over the 2021 MotoGP season and also that incredible F1 weekend in Brazil is Autosport.com editor Hayden Cobb. Hayden, thanks for joining me, mate. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to see you back on the show. Uh, let's look back at that 2021 season. The talking points from what was a really enjoyable year. Yeah, well, Fabio Quattro coming onto the forefront and being the sort of Yamaha team leader and going on to sort of capture the title. It was a very interesting dynamic when he sort of stepped up to the factory team obviously fighting for the title last year and it all fell a bit apart. He worked on it on the winter, both himself with a sports psychologist and also Yamaha sort of fine-tuned the bike, sorted out their engine issues. And he very much sort of just led, led from the front, picked up the wins, kept everything smooth, confident. And then on the other side of the garage, obviously we had the, what became a disaster with Maverick Vinales in yeah. terms of, he basically did the opposite and sort of lost it mentally. Um, and had the incident in Austria where he was trying to blow up the engine and eventually basically got sacked by, by Yamaha and off he went to Aprilia. So great season for him, um, but there was plenty of challenges at Ducati, like Francesco Bagnaia came on really strong at the end of the year. I enjoyed watching him race this year, I've got to say. Yeah, yeah, and he's going to be a big title fight for, for next year, especially with all the Ducatis. It's going to be eight Ducatis on the grid next year. And if they can do what they were doing at the back end of the year, 
they will be a big, big sort of thing to beat for Quattuaro and the, and the rest of them. That Vinales implosion mm. really did make headlines. Did you see it coming? He's always shown fractures of this sort of mental weakness, let's say. He's a lovely guy, but he, he does struggle when the pressure's on, and it clearly was mounting and mounting. And, and don't get me wrong, there was clearly blame on both sides because he was asking for certain things that just Yamaha weren't able to deliver or just it wasn't possible. But when it came to it, the Yamaha said, we've, we've done everything you want. We've, we've even changed crew chiefs and changed everything around. And, and he just ultimately had himself to blame, really. But that relationship was, was broken and shattered. He yeah. had to split it up. And he's found a new life in Aprilia that hopefully will give him some joy as well as Aprilia. Now, you and I discussed it earlier this season. We discussed it with Kevin Schwantz as well. The return of Marc Marquez. Would we ever see Marquez back to his brilliant best? A race winner yeah. this year, unexpectedly, and then tragically, you know, ruled out by season's end with, with another injury. Yeah, in a strange way, it's symmetrical, but in a horrible way for, for Marquez in terms of being out for those first few rounds with the arm injury, coming back, very emotional sort of comeback, and then getting those wins, some at the circuits where he's just been dominant at forever, mm. and those were expected. But like you say, there was a couple of wins in there that even, even then were like, well, like the, is the, the real Marc Marquez coming back? And then just as we're sort of thinking about that and then probably looking towards next year, yeah, he suffers concussion and then gets the sort of the double vision problem, which he had many years ago. And, and it's early days, but that could be, again, like a months and months of sort of out of action. So it's, it's very difficult to see what, what comes next for him. Uh, as always in MotoGP, but no longer after this year, the big headline, Valentino Rossi retiring from the sport. What a rider, what a career. Massively. I mean, he's been in Grand Prix racing almost as long as I've been alive. It sort of reveals a lot about me and a lot about Valentino. Um, but just a, a massive presence in the motorsport world, in the sporting world. It's going to be difficult for MotoGP to replace him. They've got a lot of young stars. Marquez is obviously another one that sort of could take the mantle if he's fit and healthy. But as the brand, as the personality, as the rivals that he's had over the years, it, it, that is a story that is now, is now ended. But he will be on the grid next year through his teams and through his other sort of ventures. So he was not gone completely. Um, to join the chat now, actually, um, phoning in from uh, the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia, uh, Juan Pablo Montoya. Juan Pablo, I just want to get your thoughts on Valentino Rossi's retirement from MotoGP, because this is a guy who isn't just a rider. He transcends everything that we do in, in motor racing. Oh, it's been amazing. you got to give Valentino credit for everything he's done. He had an amazing career. I remember I met him. I used to go to a lot of MotoGP races when I started in F1. We always used to go to Jerez and, you know, they're like two or three races a year. And, I've, you know, I've always been a huge fan of MotoGP. And for him to retire, as you said, you know, I mean, he was the, you know, icon of MotoGP. So I think it's a great opportunity for the, a lot of the younger younger guys to to rise to the occasion and, and become become the next big star. There's rumours he might end up in endurance racing. Do you think you're going to have him as a rival? <laughs> With Valentino, you never know. You know, he, <laughs> he was big into rally a few years ago. He won, you know what I mean? He always used to do that monster rally and everything. So you never know. Uh, I'm sure he's going to try something. He just He's a little bit like me that you just can't stay still and you always got to come up with new things to do. <laughs> I, I think we can all agree on the brilliance of uh, Valentino Rossi. Let's move to slightly more controversial topics. The Brazilian Grand Prix and most notably Max Verstappen versus Lewis Hamilton. It always seems to happen on a sprint weekend uh, that these two have something between each other. Turn four, lap 48. Juan Pablo, how did you see that defensive manoeuvre from Max Verstappen, which is now being appealed by Mercedes? Ah... <sighs> <laughs> my honest opinion <laughs> yes i want your honest opinion he my honest opinion i mean he the way i think max looks at it is if they crash he gains points you know what i mean the the more as long as louis doesn't finish ahead of him he's in a better situation for the championship and i think he if you look at as far as louis was alongside him and nearly clear him in the breaking zone there was no way as late as he break he was going to make the corner and and he i don't think he had much of an intention of making the corner you know what i mean i don't i don't have anything against max i actually really like max and 
and Red Bull, and they've done an amazing job to bring the fight to Mercedes. But I think they're being surprised of how good Mercedes was. Are you surprised that incident wasn't even investigated, given what has gone before this season? Honestly, in my personal experience, is whoever is doing it either gets a big deal or no deal at all. And and you can look at Lewis' expression on the radio when he goes, oh, yeah, of course, it wasn't even investigated. <laughs> <laughs> Hayden, what's your take on it? When I saw it live, the interesting reaction was, oh, that's going to be investigated. That's probably going to be a penalty. It's things we've seen before. And there was a couple of replays and maybe you can understand sort of the justification for it but I'd still sort of I can see why Mercedes have appealed it and I think penalty probably would have been a the right thing to pick out but that's just from my humble <laughs> humble eyes I, I can't really say from a from a racer's experience in terms of where that would go um in what terms do you of think? what do I think <laughs> what I think's not important um I okay I think it's I think it's marginal and 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 I think that I actually think Max had the had the right to do what he did to defend that line. By the time Lewis goes off, the cars aren't side by side anymore, so it's debatable whether it's crowding or not. So, well, Pablo, you, tell me. You tell me. Okay, you tell, but, 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 okay you tell, hit, hit me, hit me. So in Austria, when they were going, people were going side by side, and the guy in the outside wasn't even given enough room in the corner because there was gravel. They were penalising the guy in the inside. And here the guy drove him completely off the racetrack. How do you justify it? And this is where it gets difficult, isn't it? By using precedent, because every corner is unique. Every move is unique. You're talking different speeds, different positioning of the cars. How do you compare two incidents? Juan Pablo, don't tell me in your entire career, you've held the inside line. Someone's gone for an outside move and you've braked a little bit later, maybe eased off the throttle, maybe just opened the steering up a little bit to force the issue. Don't tell me you never did that. I'm not saying you don't. I'm, I'm not saying that you. But when I've done it, I got in trouble for it. <laughs> um, I mean, do you think did Max okay. did the right thing to defend it? Yes. Max did the right thing to defend the, the situation and the position. And he was either do or let him win the race. That at the end of the day, he still won the race. But was he in a position to go that far on the braking zone? I think he was expecting for Lewis to turn and worst case scenario, Lewis doesn't finish the race and he finishes the race because Lewis is around the outside. So Lewis had a lot to lose and I think Lewis was really smart not to even try to turn in because Max was going for the crash, like what happened in, in you know, it was a little bit of a return move to to a little bit like Silverstone. Yes, it's a, a lot slower corner, but it, the president was kind of the same thing. You know what I mean? He, he missed the apex. I mean, look how Lewis got criticized for the crash in Silverstone. That is a really fast corner because he missed the apex. Max didn't even try to make the corner. So here's, here's the interesting thing. It is, so Silverstone, Lewis is on the inside. Max is on the inside. Max could have run wide like Lewis did here in Brazil. Chose not to. They make contact. We then move to Monza. Again, they're side by side. Lewis perhaps a little bit ahead going in through turn one. By the time they get to turn two, Max is slightly ahead. Lewis tries to close the door. They make contact. Is the case here, Lewis has learnt from both Silverstone and Monza to give Max that room. And ultimately, he lived to fight another day. Yes, but is it OK what Max is doing? That's the question is, why is Max getting away with this and some other guys don't? I mean, is, are mm. they are they applying the rules the same for everybody, or is Max getting treated different because he's young or whatever you want to call it? But you know, what I mean, so I, I go, I put, I'm gonna put another name out there. If Massapin did that, would he get be penalised? That's a good question, uh, Hayden. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? Well, you're right, and, and that's what sort of Mercedes and Toto Wolff in particular were saying after the race of like. The diplomacy is gone. It, there was a bit of a hint of like Verstappen's not basically being allowed to get away with it. And if there's a crash, obviously it's still advantage to him, as, as we sort of talked about earlier. Can we all agree, though, between the three of us, it's far better that this was decided on track than being decided in the stewards' room with a brilliant move pulled off by Lewis to, to take the win? 
Okay, what happens if Lewis doesn't manage to get the move and that was the only move? And and Max wins the race. If ifs and buts were candy That's, and nuts, we'd uh, all have a Merry Christmas. Uh, uh, it, if it, you, you can only deal with what I'll happened. I'll take a Merry Christmas. We're, we're not dealing with <laughs> hypotheticals. It was a great move. It did, you know, and Lewis backed off expecting a decision or an investigation from the stewards when he realised it wasn't going to happen. Pow, he's through. And it was. I loved the fact that we saw that on track. We saw hard racing, but then we saw that decisive move. It was great, but I think, again, in retrospective, you can't judge it on what happens after it. We've talked about this yeah. before, is if yeah, like as if you didn't win the race, didn't have the fantastic move, but then that stays there. It's like, well, then apparently should have been involved. Well, you've got to take that out of the if, buts and maybes and just go. So, well, Pablo, ultimately... If you think ultimate. about it, with the, one of the things with the move is Max never even made the corner. It's not like he ran Lewis wide and he made the corner. Max missed the corner 100%. And well, I think that's a big yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going gonna, gonna to be fascinating to see how they decide it. Is this ultimately all about clarity, knowing what is and isn't allowed? Because similarly, you know, I'm thinking back to Mexico when Daniel Ricciardo nerfs into the back of Valtteri Bottas and doesn't even get investigated. And a couple of races previously, Pierre Gasly gets a five second penalty, uh, two points on his license for being the meat in the sandwich at the start of the Turkish Grand Prix. Yeah, it is that inconsistency that's the problem. Welcome the to my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, final question while we've got you, Juan Pablo. Um, Mattia Binotto Ferrari saying that Lewis's brilliant fight back from 20th and last in the sprint to P5 shows that reverse grid sprints are the way forward. Do you agree? Yes. I know when you're tradition and you're F1 and you don't want to change anything, but at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, motorsport is a show. And we put up a really good show. And what Lewis did there and what he show is capable of, what you're capable of doing is incredible. And, you know, ra you know the racecraft is really an art and he's shown he's still got it. And I think it was unbelievable. I think it's, it's definitely a two thumbs up to F1 for that one. Hayden? See, I disagree, but I do understand the, the, the sort of the argument. But when you've got sort of 30 kph more top speed, the, those overtakes are much easier than, say, when everyone's at the back. And that's the yeah, idea. Yeah, you had that 30k, you know, when you add DRS in as well. His actual top speed wasn't that different to Mazepin's through the speed trap without DRS. True, but when it's just one car coming through the pack, that's much easier because you, as in you're just going through there. If you do the full reverse thing, which would be the plan, you're going to have a, a Verstappen in front of you, a Bottas in front of you. And then that makes it difficult. And I think they find it, they basically end up fighting each other for 12th. And I'm that's with, why I don't think it will work. I'm with Juan Pablo. I'm absolutely with Juan Pablo. Let's have qualifying on the front. A Saturday reverse grid sprint race, get some points for that, and then you revert to how the qualifying f finished on a Friday for your gr race grid on Sunday. Let's have some fun on the Saturday, you know? Yeah, I'm not against I fun, agree. and I, I think it's worth a go. Yeah, uh, a hell of a show, and, and people are really up for seeing some passing soon, some racing. And as you said, qualifying on Friday will set the grid for Sunday, so Saturday is just a bonus for points. You're racing for points. And your racecraft and your ability will give you a better result. Yes, I agree with you that having all the fast cars on the back is going to be difficult, but it's going to be a bottleneck because the slow cars are going to be in the front. So whoever manages the traffic better and make the smarter decisions will benefit 100% from the results. I always liked you, Juan Pablo. Um, lovely stuff. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show, man. Um, appreciate it massively. Uh, you're out in Barcelona uh, at the moment uh, for some for a little bit of testing. Yeah, my son's testing the regional. Uh, you know, preparing for next season, uh, and that's about it. Lovely stuff, man. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. We, we appreciate it as always massively. Thanks for your opinions. Um, thank you, Juan Pablo, and thank you, Hayden, for coming in, my friend. Thank you both uh, for your insight and your opinions. And that is pretty much all we've got time for on this week's episode of This Week. Things we learned today. Fred Vasseur gets darker as the questions get harder. Did you see that? That was weird. Uh, Jose Maria Lopez reckons the World Endurance Championship is in line for a game-changing season. And brutally honest, Juan Pablo Montoya is the only Juan Pablo Montoya. Thanks so much for tuning in, folks. Uh, it's been a 
Great, great pleasure as always. Uh, do please join us next week for the next edition of This Week.